for the primary caregivers in the audience, is there a way to diagnose the Lynch syndrome besides uh, history? I think history is the main tip, but my main take home message is when you have an index colorectal case, there is the Europeans as well as the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia is now making a play for testing every colorectal sample universally for Lynch syndrome. NCCN has not yet adopted it, but NCCN sort of alludes to it. There is a, um, a genomic uh, application for prevention and practice group at CDC, which has bluntly said that since you are missing 15% of these people, everybody that is a colorectal carcinoma should get immunohistochemistry and MSI. And from that point on, if it is appropriate, the oncologist must begin search for Lynch syndrome. So that's where it's headed. And Europeans, again, have come out with the same thing, saying that we're missing too much and we should proceed to test for it. So all my basic take home is, besides the history, do a good job of trying to find other cases. When you have a colorectal cancer, look for a biology to point if there are other family members to be rescued. Yes. I think a lot of people don't have colonoscopy and screening and even at the rate of the rate. Isn't that an issue also in diagnosis? Absolutely. Yeah, and once you have Lynch syndrome, the, the, the colonoscopy age drops to significantly. Uh, sometimes the frequency drops. Uh, they become, you know, much carefully watched. We are not really sure how to look for their gastric malignancies. It's not easy, you know, like Japanese, we can't do annual upper endoscopies yet because the numbers are not that high. We don't know how to look for their urothelial malignancies. People have then suggested doing annual or biannual urinary analysis for malignant cells, and that has not panned out. So other tumors, but the endometrial, for example, you know, menometrorrhagia, annual um, uh, ultrasound, all of those things start to operate if you have Lynch syndrome. So in my mind, you're looking for frequent colonoscopy at a younger age in other probands. And in other women, again, a very aggressive look and search for endometrial. If you can get most of the endometrial and colon cancers, I think you're doing great. The other rarer tumors, I don't yet have a strategy. But missing an endometrial in a sister or a mother or somebody who should have been found is unacceptable. They are not getting annual checkups. The pap smear is sort of disappearing because if you are 55, 60 and you never had a positive pap smear, that means you were never infected with HPV. That means you're never going to get positive pap smear. So the annual pap smear is sort of running out of steam. On the other hand, this issue is major, endometrial. So and endometrial is not easy to treat. It is, those of you who have treated it, once it, if it is not found early, it post chemo relapses and the plumbing issues and the death are very, very painful. So it is something that needs to focus on. Is there any increase in lung cancer in this syndrome? Lung, no. no. <clears throat> uh, how often has the practice of screening lung cancer in various people been adopted? Right now? <coughs> So no, the big development is of, uh, I think, four or five days ago, where the CMS panel said that they will pay for it. So now it's um, standard of care for patients uh, at uh, med Medicare aid. <coughs> uh, and you know, that's, that's a talk you know, by itself. Um, you know, screening for lung cancer decreased uh, mortality uh, of lung cancer by 20 percent, decrease all case mortality by 6.7 percent. Um, it is very hard to justify not doing it. Um, so, you know, I would say, with that said, uh, the take uh, primarily, primarily by primary care physicians has been extremely low. And that, that's certainly the experience in, in Seattle. This recommendation is for the smokers, right? Yeah. High risk, how, how do they define high risk smokers? Who are these people? Yeah, people that have more than a, I think 30 pack a year of smoking has uh, stopped smoking less than 15 years and from ages 55 to 74. Although uh, the NCCN guidelines are a little broader than this, you know, it's hard to imagine that um, um, if someone has a, um, 54 years and, and a 35-pack year of smoking, then they should not be screened. Uh, 
that doesn't make much sense. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you know the talking about colon cancer, um, the the mortality of colon cancer should be close to zero. I mean, you have an extremely effective way of early diagnosis of the disease. So you know, if everybody had their colonoscopies as recommended, you know, very few people would be dying of of colon cancer. Um, and and we continue to do a poor job on that as Sushma pointed out. Um, I think that uh, our colleagues uh, uh, or our friends in the, in the industry, in healthcare industry, in pharmacy, um, know that doctors have an enormous amount of inertia. Uh, you know, we learn to do things one way and keep doing it, and then some new data comes along and say, oh no, I have to do screening now. I don't really know how to send, and you know, what if there is a nodule? Uh, da, 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 da. I think that the most effective uh, screening clinics are like we have at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. We provide a full array of service. You know, you send the patient to us, we'll take care of it. Um, you know, if there is a nodule that needs follow up, the patient will be returned to you with a final recommendation. You know, very much like is the case uh, in the breast cancer evaluation at our centers and in, in many centers as well. Yeah, but but you know, think about the think about the lung cancer care in the U.S. Uh, I think that 40 per 60 percent of patients uh, operated for lung cancer in the U.S. are operated by general general surgeons, and and there is significant evidence suggesting that the outcome is much worse. worse. Oh, yeah. um, so you know that that's you already have cancer. Um, of course, we should provide you know the the best care to everybody. But the management of nodules, you know, takes the nuances of lung cancer care to just another level. So, you know, you have to be in a setting where there is a, a cardiothoracic surgeon that has most of his or her practice dedicated to thoracic surgery. Uh, and, and that's unfortunately the um, exception, not the rule. I think the Europeans are ahead of us there because <clears throat> these things will only happen in tertiary care center with X amount of cases in their results. With, for example, liver in Barcelona, it just you need quite a transplant in Spain, you gotta go to Barcelona. And their results are spectacular and because the whole team just does that. Uh, here, because our ethos, uh, capitalism and otherwise, is that everybody, wherever, sets up an enterprise, they'll do it. But this is an area where it's not just a question of uh, adequate surgery, it's a question of pre-op evaluation. Is that patient gonna stand physiologically the lung resection? What kind of quality of life? And then surgery, and then it, are we curing it at the end? And so it's, it's pretty involved, and it may not be a bad idea to have 20 centers or 15 centers identified where this is concentrated and done properly. Just as bone marrow transplants, you know, every place did not get going. Yeah, we have a very interesting uh, arrangement with the Department of Defense. So um, uh, workers that have worked at uh, Hanford um, have a extremely high rate of lung cancer. Likely a combination of other risk factors plus the radiation. You know, so the painter at Rain Hanford, well, it turns out he was a smoker as well, and uh, he got exposed to the, the radiation. Um, so they get their CT scans done at Tri-Cities. Those images are sent to our center, uh, read by a radiologist who has a special interest in lung cancer screening. 
If uh, a, a nodule needs follow-up, the patient comes from the Tri-Cities with everything scheduled and gets everything done in 48 hours. I was interested, uh, Renato, in your comments about uh, using bevacizumab in lung cancer patients that you've found that you can disregard the urine uh, protein findings that they're sort of clinically irrelevant. Dr. Mehta, do you feel the same way about I it? Absolutely. For the last several years, I tried to chase it when we were using Avastin for lung cancer, for colorectal, and finally basically stopped looking for it. Certainly would make things. I thought I was going easier. to get dinged. You know, you would no, say. No, no, no. And colorectal so, cancer is very important. No, I was and so I'm, happy no. you made that statement because I was feeling guilty all these years that that's one area I have. Even fellows would come and ask me and said, ignore it, keep going. And, yeah, we, you know, and we, then I would feel bad. So we have published data. Um, you know, we we had patients that had uh, uh, one and a half, two, two and a half, three grams of uh, protein in the urine. So what? You know, this is people that have stage four lung cancer, right, that have exactly. stage four yeah, going. colon cancer, and if their disease is under control and their albumin is okay and that they are not blowing up like a balloon. Only, yeah, only exception why, was the Why clinic. do I care you know, how much protein they have in the urine? And when we look retrospectively, that's exactly what the doctors did. You know, they kept measuring and they kept doing the same thing that they were doing, so what's the point? That's refreshing. <laughs> Um, One thing we can do that it's cheaper. Yes, that's not. right. Reduce the cost. That's right. I, I uh, was interested in the uh, Oncoplex uh, profile that you're using there. How much molecular profiling should we do on every patient with non-small cell lung cancer? How so, much? So as, as, as you probably uh, figure it out, this uh, last meeting of the uh, NCCN uh, lung cancer panel was extremely interesting. Um, and one of the things that came out of that, if you look at the most recent version, which is like I think uh, three or four weeks old, there is a very strong statement about uh, broad molecular profiling. And I've, I've never seen anything be put, be put to a vote in our panel that had uh, uh, that degree of, uh, of acceptance. So for patients that uh, are EGFR and AUK negative. The NCCM panel, and I certainly feel the same way, feel very strongly that these patients should have broad molecular profiling. <coughs> and the rationale is twofold. One, there are drugs that are already available. And two, you cannot these days advise a patient regarding options of clinical trial without that knowledge. Um, so, you know, I guess one, uh, one, uh, one argument would be, well, if someone has a, a, a BRAF a V600D mutation, they should go to a place that there is a clinical <coughs> trial. Is that fair? You know, if you live in Sodoma, Alaska, and you're, you know, you found that the tumor has a, a BRAF mutation, you're gonna turn to the patient and say you have to move to Seattle? That's crazy. Uh, that's not equity. That's totally unfair. Um, on the other hand, we can't, uh, you know, for these, uh, you know, if you think that ALK is rare, uh, you know, ROS1, um, I've been telling fellows and patients that there are five groups of patients with lung cancer that have a totally different outcome than we were, we were accustomed to. EGFR mutation, ALK translocation, ROS1, which actually may do better than the ALK translocation group, um, and so these are three are very well characterized. You know, can do molecular profiling of the tumor. We know who they are. There are two groups that we still don't have a biomarker. We don't know who they are. One is what I showed. You know, the patients that have a tremendous response to these immunotherapies and remain with the disease control for a very prolonged period of time. Uh, they they are living now years with with stage four lung cancer. And the other one, which I'm sure all of you have in your practices, is people with a tremendous response to maintenance pemetrexate <coughs> that goes 6, 12, yeah. 18, 20, yeah. 30 cycles on maintenance pemetrexate. And, and if you stop, it will grow again. Um, 
but we don't know who they are. Uh, you know, we don't have a, a good biomarker to, to find out they who are, they are. In our practice, they are defined as Elimta deficient people. <laughs> in Chicago, I had a gemcitabine deficient pancreatic cancer woman who for seven years was on gem. As soon as we stopped, the disease would progress. Yep. She had more gemcitabine in her system than the company had in its warehouses. But <laughs> the, the, we kind of side funny story. Um, the, we have a, a, one of our doctors who many of you have, may know, um, and he has been very open about this, uh, was diagnosed with ALL. And uh, so all his patients had to be assigned to other physicians. So this most junior person in our group received this uh, patient with, uh, on cycle 72 of uh, pamatrexate. So she comes to me and says, you know, this guy is on cycle 72, uh, wh what are we doing? I said, I don't know what you're doing, but you're not stopping in the first time you meet the patient because if the disease grows, the next time you see him, he's never going to forgive you. Uh, so she laughed and thought it was funny. And then she stopped at 75 and he grew. So, I mean, they agreed to stop. But, um, and then put back on it and responded again, or at least what didn't grow. Uh, so, you know, obviously that's an extreme example, you know, don't even talk about cost, so 75 it, cycles it, of pemetrexin. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because uh, without actually creating an algorithm, what we have been doing is those who are ALK negative, EGFR negative, and go on conventional therapy, we've been very tempted to start them on an alimta based treatment. If they respond, then we have a track. If they don't respond, of course, carbotexol, Evastin is waiting. Is that a reasonable thought process? Yeah, so we, we at, uh, is there someone from Genentech here? Uh, I think they left already. Um, we never jump into the bevacizumab bandwagon. Or, mm -mm. So our first line is a, a, a pemetrexid um, um, doublet. So we, we go four cycles and then maintenance uh, uh, pemetrexid. I mean, do I think it's perfectly reasonable to give carboplatin, paclitaxel, and bevacizumab and continue with bevacizumab maintenance? Of course, of course that's yeah. standard of care. Uh, but that that has not been our choice. Uh, we've, we we um, use, and I'm not proud of it, we use sparingly at one point, carboplatin, pemetrexet, and bevacizumab, uh, uh, but I think that the data does not support that choice anymore. So um, basically what you're saying is that one could begin with Elimta, and those who don't respond have then other options, but those who respond, you already have a track which may sometimes produce a fairly long-term response. Yeah, I, t I tell my patients that the amount of time that you're gonna be well is directly dependent on how much mileage we can get from each horse. Right. So you're on top of the horse, we'll, we'll keep going indefinitely. You know, obviously if you're not tolerating, it's a yeah. different story. But if the tumor is not growing, we'll keep going. Maybe, obviously that's what everybody does. Yeah, so um, the way we do it, we do, our turnaround time for Oncoplex is six weeks. The turnaround for foundation medicine, once they get the tissue, is three weeks. Um, I think that probably both are not okay for first line choice. Uh, so what we do is that for a single charge, um, we'll do the EGFR and ALK separately. And then we'll run the six week platform. So I would do the EGFR and ALK. If it comes back positive, that's it. Uh, because usually people don't have multiple uh, driver mutations. Usually that would be incredibly rare. Um, but if those are not found, absolutely. You know, obviously ALK is rare. Um, ROS is even less Better. common. It's gonna be a, a third of your ALK uh, percentage wise. But I, it's life changing. I mean, if you have a ROS translocation, you grow in chrysotinib, you, you could be on therapy for a year and a half, two years uh, with, a, with an excellent response. So you, you have to find out. You know, if you said, you know, what about this 73 year old um, smoker that, that 
you know, smoke uh, up to the week of the diagnosis, do I really have to do broad molecular profiling? Is that even financially responsible to make that choice? I would say that that's up to debate. You know, it's like the discussion we were having, you know, during the break. Where do we draw a line of what is uh, equitable and should be done to everybody? Um, you know, I suspect that if we did molecular profiling to every patient with lung cancer in the U.S., uh, you know, that's all we we're going to do. There is nothing. <laughs> there is no more money for healthcare after that. Um, so, you know, there has to be some choice, but individually for each person, you know, if someone came to me and said, I want to I wanna leave no stone unturned, one of our best ALK responses, um, COPD on oxygen because of uh, um, smoking. Um, is that rare? Tremendously rare. Uh, but if, if a single individual patient says, you know, I, I want to do everything, well, that's, that's no stone left unturned. Are EGFR and ALK mutually exclusive? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that's Every, what our pathologist does. They do the EGFR first. If that's negative, they proceed with ALK. Largely because we are a safety net hospital, yeah. you know, Again, the hospital absorbs the cost. So. <clears throat> that, that's absolutely a financial decision. Uh, you know, our, the turnaround time in our institution is uh, um, for EGFR is five days and um, ALK is, you know, 72 hours. That's, that's what we have. So you could, you could do them sequentially, you know, start with the most common, obviously, start with the EGFR. If that's negative, do the ALK. Um, but, I mean, the reality is that, like everything in medicine, our turnaround time is six weeks. It was eight, down to six. We think that by we think that by mid next year it will be down to four. And in parallel, fun, Foundation Medicine, which is a private-owned company, will probably go from three to two, um, you know, perhaps even less than that. Uh, and the cost will go from five thousand to thirty-five hundred to two thousand, and da 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 da, da and that will become an unknown issue. You know, we're only going to do the broad molecular profiling, and that's all we're going to do. Especially when choice of a wrong drug is going to cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars anyway. And there's no choice. <clears throat> it's just, it's the, and as he rightly said, when you decide to put a patient on trial, uh, for example, we have TGen group in uh, our town, and we really don't have a patient to go for a second biopsy. If you had all the data to start with, it becomes possible to say, okay, this is the trial, this is what is open, this is the molecule they have, we're ready to go there. So I think more you have, better off you are. Yeah, you know, we have a, pri a trial of uh, BRAF uh, uh, mutated, that they got a BRAF mm -hmm. and a MEK inhibitor, so kind of same strategy as in melanoma. melanoma. There is no way we could do that trial if we didn't have Oncoplex. I mean, I, I can't screen 100 patients in a clinical trial, have them sign consent form and find one that it's a candidate for the study. We have to go the other way around. We have to look at our database, see how many patients have a BRAF mutation, then approach them for that clinical trial. That's, that's the only feasible way of conducting that kind of research. And putting an end to that, and that's why the, the NCCN panel made such a strong statement. I, I encourage you to read how it reads the statement at the, uh, of the NCCN guidelines. Because that's an issue of moving the science forward. You know, if we stop molecular profiling, we're going to put a huge barrier to the progress of, uh, of non-small cell lung cancer. That's why we felt so strongly that the pushback uh, from the insurance companies war, um, was a detriment to the lives of our patients. Stage two, it's a must. Uh, the not mismatch repair, but the recommendations that the CDC group has, which not everybody has yet followed, is that every tumor will get a MSI estimation as well as a, a immunohistochemistry. And if there is a less protein, meaning less uh, of one of the genes that is mutated, and you have a microsatellite instability, that is the point to start looking for Lynch syndrome. So they're basically, again, 
uh, not many labs do it that well, and it's all a question of what is your local pathologist, where is it going, how much is possible, where well, information comes back, is it possible to make sense out of it? So I think it's just getting going. But what I, my suggestion is to discuss with your pathologists and your teams what should you be currently doing, and the strategy is to pick up at pathology level possibility of search for Lynch, besides the you know, family history and other things we have been doing. So. All right. I think that's it. I think it is. Thank, I want to thank our presenters very much for their contributions today. It was an excellent conference. I also want to thank all the participants. Nurses, um, if you'll need to fill out a, a, a survey so that you can get your um, uh, continuing education units, and Chelsea has those forms. Otherwise, I would say uh, thanks to the presenters, thanks to all of you, thanks to Dr. Shah, and uh, Good afternoon. Thank you so much.